everyone, and welcome to the Future Workforce podcast. My name is Ryan, and I'm here with today's guest, Liam Martin. Liam is the co-founder and chief marketing officer here at Time Doctor, which provides the best in-class time tracking and employee monitoring software that helps hundreds of businesses around the world to operate remotely. He's also the co-organizer of Running Remote, which is the world's largest conference for building and scaling remote teams. So Liam, hello, and welcome to the show. Thanks for theoretically having me, <laughs> Ryan. Uh, it's, I, I don't think I've ever been on the podcast before, so this is very exciting to be on. Yeah, and, and we're thrilled to have you. Um, you know, bringing your expertise to the table, I think is going to benefit a lot of people. We like to keep it practical here, so looking forward to having you share um, some insights there. Um, but to, to start, I want to help the listeners learn a little bit more about you and that expertise that you do bring to the table. So can you start by telling us a little bit about your background and how you became a remote work pioneer? Sure. So that started almost 20 years ago. I was actually running a tutoring business and I had gotten out of grad school um, effectively by choice, but I ended up teaching a class at McGill University, which is about 15 minutes that way. And at the end of that class, I got the worst academic reviews in the history of the department. I remember one comment very specifically, it was uh, not helpful or useful to students, an all round really bad teacher uh, would not take his class again. And I remember walking into my, my professor's office, the person that was working with me throughout my thesis, and uh, his name was Morton Weinfeld, and he said, he said, uh, man, that was really rough. And I said, yeah, I don't think I'm very good at this. And he said, no, you're not. And then I said, well, what do you think I should do? And he said, you've really got to get good at this teaching thing for the next 10 to 20 years before you can actually do anything fun in terms of research. So I remember six weeks later, I threw a master's thesis under his door and I was out into the real world. And that turned into a business that I ended up running, which was an online tutoring business. And that ended up having dozens of tutors throughout North America and Europe, primarily graduate students that were tutoring undergraduate students to pass their, um, <clears throat> their Math 1-2, Chem 1-2, Bio 1-2, um, requirements to enter medical school. And one of the problems that I had inside of that business was I couldn't actually figure out whether a tutor really worked with a student. I wasn't able to actually document those hours effectively. And I'd have students that would come to me saying, I didn't actually work with my tutor for 10 hours. I worked with them for five hours. And then I'd have to go to the tutor and I'd say, hey, did you work with Jimmy for five hours or 10 hours? And he said, well, I worked with him for 10. I billed you for 10. I'd end up having to refund the student for five hours and then pay the tutor for the full 10 hours. And I'd up I would end up losing money in the deal. This was really problematic, completely destroying the business. And that's when uh, I ended up talking with Rob and he had a tool that could completely solve that problem. It was a crappy old alpha. We hadn't had any paid customers or any customers at all at that point. And I said, hey, you know what? This is something that I should really work on. Um, and... I've been working remotely for about 15 to 20 years. Uh, I can't remember the exact amount of time, actually. And during that time, I've been really excited to be able to see the way that remote work is going. I think probably more has happened in the last two years than in the last 20 with regards to remote work. So for me, I think we're just, just starting to get started and recognizing that remote work is going to be not just one of those niche things that a couple computer programmers do, but something that the entire world can enjoy. Yeah, definitely uh, don't see it going away anytime soon. And, and you know, you've been deep in the remote game for such a long time. I feel like that gives you a, a big leg up. And that's, that's part of what we want to talk about here today. I mean, one of the things that you've pointed to as being truly essential to successful remote operations is asynchronous work and asynchronous management. You know, we've heard you talk about that before. Um, you've spoken about it on your YouTube channel. So for our, for our talk today, I wanted to bring some of that into our discussion. And I think it would really benefit our listeners to learn more about async and what it ent entails and how business leaders and managers now in, in this new 
world of work, um, like you said, given the changes that have happened over the last two years, um, how those leaders in any industry really can implement async to improve their remote work operations going forward? Sure. So I think for a lot of people that maybe don't really recognize what asynchronous work is, we are a asynchronous organization, meaning that we don't communicate face-to-face -face all that oft often. I often ask people a question when they're interested in async, which is, um, how do you figure out if people you're managing are actually doing a good job? Or how often do you meet with them about um, them just doing a good or a bad job? In an asynchronous organization, work focuses almost entirely on individual autonomy and allowing every team member to maximize their own productivity without necessarily being dependent upon others to actually complete a task or provide updates. So I don't know, Ryan, we don't speak synchronously about whether or not you're doing a good job. You have metrics that you've set inside of the company, and then I see those metrics through Lauren and everyone else inside of the company um, to be able to figure out whether you're doing a good job or not. We don't discuss whether you're doing a good job or a bad job because I automatically know all of those things. So the real purpose of asynchronous organization is to build the mindset so that every single team member has the maximum informational advantage to complete the job they need to do inside of the organization. And this honestly produces for me an interesting set of implications, which I obviously get into throughout the book that we're writing, which is called Running Remote, uh, which is specifically about asynchronous organizations. But the biggest one is you want to have an organization with people in it that should ideally have the same informational advantage as the CEO of the company. And you really want to focus entirely on outputs, or you want to focus entirely on outputs versus inputs into that system. So if you have an organization in which everyone has the same informational advantage as the CEO, and then you focus on outputs instead of inputs, you will generally have almost by extension an asynchronous organization, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, I'm wondering, because I've had the chance to take a peek at the book, uh, looks awesome, excited for that to come out. One of the things you mentioned are these three fundamental principles of asynchronous work. And I'm wondering if you can share with us what those are and, and maybe um, some of the details of how someone might uh, go about executing on those principles. Sure, so three core premises, which is deliberate communication, democratized process or workflows and detailed metrics. So the first one is deliberate communication. Inside of remote first organizations, we generally try to restrict synchronous communication <clears throat> because synchronous communication is actually quite messy. There's no documentation and charismatic individuals who may not necessarily have a good idea <laughs> can actually basically win over the rest of the group, not because their idea is any good, but because they're very charismatic individuals. So deliberate communication allows for everyone to be able to have equal opportunity to communicate what they want to communicate inside of an issue. And it also gives complete and utter documentation to anyone inside of that meeting or outside of that meeting. So as an example, uh, we use Asana for the vast majority of our project management and our meetings. So I can jump in to your particular meetings that you're on inside of Asana and I can see exactly what issues you've posted, what the discussions were about those particular issues and whether there was a conclusion and maybe I need to put in my two cents uh, on that one, even though I wasn't part of that discussion. Uh, democratized processes and workflows kind of feeds into the second part of this, which is anyone inside of an asynchronous organization must at their core be able to actually answer their own questions. So the platform effectively becomes the manager. We have a, I would call it effectively a wiki about the business inside of the business. So if you want to look and see what the marketing department does, how they operate their businesses, it's or operate their departments, it's all in there. And you can have access to that information, not only people inside the marketing department, but people inside of the you know, computer engineering department or the customer support department can actually get access to that information or people from outside of the organization can actually come in. This also 
really accelerates training inside of an organization. So you know, hey, you can bring someone in that's brand new. They don't know anything. Within a month, they'll know effectively everything inside of the organization without actually having a synchronous conversation with anyone inside of the organization. The third one is detailed metrics. Uh, so inside of asynchronous organizations, we generally don't discuss our metrics inside of the corporate world from what I've understood. Again, I might be speaking a little bit out of school here, but inside of the corporate world, the vast majority of those conversations are synchronous between the manager and the employees that are being managed by that individual. So that information basically stops with that manager. Inside of our organization, we think a lot about what are the metrics that require us to be able to build out this organization, and then how are those metrics shareable with everyone inside of the organization, so that anyone inside of the company can be like, wow, okay, well, why is Ryan doing this podcast as an example, what are the results of that podcast? How much money is being spent uh, on Ryan doing these podcasts? That information is available to everyone. And that allows for us to be able to very clearly identify whether or not this is a successful you know, podcast or not a successful podcast. He should be redirecting his time somewhere else. Maybe that was a little too long, but <laughs> hopefully you got the gist of it. No, that was that was very helpful. Um, it's it's definitely a different way of doing things, but it's proven to be effective in a ton of different instances <clears throat> that we've seen even before the pandemic. But now, especially since the pandemic, the people who are getting it right, um, you know, they've been able to pull a lot of benefits from that mode of operating. Um, but I want to talk about one of the challenges that keeps coming up. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've heard it over the last two years. They're one of the big hesitations that people have around remote work. And, and usually it's with people who are resistant to embracing this different way of doing things um, because they perceive it as being difficult. Um, but the, the challenge of maintaining culture across distance. Um, and I know that's a, that's a broad word that um, you know, means different things to different people. But there are those who believe that if you can't operate in an in-person or even just in a synchronous way, that it's not possible to create good culture. So I'm curious from your experience, how does asynchronous play a part in company culture for remote teams? And um, how, how can people optimize there um, when it comes to culture in async? There's a couple core assumptions inside of that question that you need to take into consideration. So number one, why is culture important? Why is culture critically important to an organization? Uh, Doist, which has been an asynchronous organization since they became a company, they have a task management app called Todoist. They have a fantastic culture, but they talk about how culture is actually about work. It's not some type of ethereal concept that exists outside of it. So inside of asynchronous organizations, um, number one, our culture is focused on the work that we do inside of our organization. So even the definition of culture, I mean, I love that this term gets thrown around a lot because to me, um, coming from an anthropological sociological background, culture fundamentally is what do you uniquely do that other groups do not? That's the definition of culture from a sociological perspective. So what weird stuff do we do inside of this company that other companies don't do? In 2019, that would have been, well, we work remotely, which is very rare and not many organizations work this way. And more importantly, we have team members in dozens of different countries all across the world that all collaborate in a very asynchronous way. What unique variables can we pull out of that that people would be interested in engaging with and people would say, yeah, I want to work in this company because I want to be able to work as a digital nomad or I want to be able to work anywhere I want or I just want to be able to take my work with me or I don't care what time I work. I just care that we actually get the work done. These are all core tenants of what I think ties our culture together inside of this company. The other big assumption that you're pulling into this is, and I think that culture is almost entirely a retention tool. 
So not many people really talk about this, which is, well, why do we talk about culture? Because we want people to be super sticky and not leave the company, which makes the business owners of that company more money, right? Totally understand. But inside of asynchronous organizations, we have the ability to be able to onboard and offboard people very, very quickly. No single individual inside of an asynchronous organization should be dependent upon another for operations inside of that business. So if tomorrow, Ryan, you said, hey, you know what? I've had enough of this. I don't want to work here anymore. I got an offer somewhere else. The measurement for whether or not we're a good asynchronous organization is whether that person could just walk away, literally get hit by a bus tomorrow, and the operations of the business would continue. No single individual is uniquely important. I talk about this a lot. I call it sacred knowledge inside of the organization. No one has that sacred knowledge inside of the organization. And most people that talk about culture honestly have a few people inside of that organization that effectively have a gun to the head of the organization, or they've got a grenade that they want to pull that pin on and saying, hey, you know what? I might want to leave. I want to do something else. And this culture statement is what's trying to reinforce that. Um, to me, I think one of our unique tenants inside of our culture is if you want to stay, stay, if you want to keep working in the company, keep working in the company. If you don't, then don't. Uh, when do you want to leave the company, right? We have those conversations a lot inside of the organization. Hey, I want to spend five, 10 years working in this company, or I want to spend one to two years. I'd hire both of those people. I would just know what requirements I need from both of them. So basically, I just don't like the statement of reinforcing culture inside of remote first organizations, because at their core, remote first organizations allow for the access to labor in a significantly more efficient way than any other method. And this not only makes the employee's life a lot easier, you can literally like stop working for someone else and start working for someone else within the day. But more importantly, if you actually have all your processes structured properly, it's really advantageous to the employer as well, because then the individuals are not necessarily, you're, you're not held at gunpoint to those individuals inside of the organization because they can say, hey, well, you know what? If you don't want to work here anymore, totally understand. I'm going to go get you a job somewhere else that's even better, or maybe you already got one. And let's just figure out how we can offboard you as quickly as possible. Um, so I don't like the statement culture. Again, it's something that really bugs me because you're going to hear, you could probably check out 10,000 podcasts on company culture, but no one really knows what the hell they're talking about. Totally agree. And, and we've had that discussion with guests on this show before. Um, you know, culture is not your mandatory Zoom happy hours. You can, you can do those for yeah. engagement, but that's not your culture. It I mean, and then it's like, it, we, okay, now guys, it's Friday at 4 p.m. Culture is now starting. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone must report to the culture Zoom room and we must play, you know, Cards Against Humanity, but not the fun one, the one that, you know, isn't R-rated. So, and everyone must report for culture time. Come on, like, give it a break. This is not, this is not how you build culture inside of an organization. Culture shouldn't be forced. Uh, when I look at all of the things that we do, one of the things that uh, we did inside of the company was we got a department Oculus Rifts, which are the, the, the headsets, virtual reality headsets. And um, what I was really measuring was would that group of people, so we, we started a voluntary, would you like to play Oculus Rift, you know, one afternoon a week, as an example, for an hour or two. We had some people opt in. And then what I was measuring is what is the dividend of that activity? Meaning, are they actually going to meet on Monday to play as well? Are they going to meet on Thursday to play as well? Are they going to be really passionate about it? Are they going to stay past the two hours that we've officially defined as our Oculus Rift time? That is the only thing that you should measure as a dividend from culture, which is them meeting together voluntarily. And anything that's done at gunpoint effectively is just 
to be honest with you, it's trash. <laughs> I wouldn't, I, I, I would not, uh, if you think that you have a strong culture, but everyone is required to be able to, you know, perform in some type of cultural activity, run an anonymous survey and ask them whether or not they like it or they would want to do something else instead. Uh, you'll be pretty surprised at the results. Yeah, I think there's some people out there who would be shocked if they actually ran that experiment. Um, it's interesting, you, you mentioned the Oculus, and that was deliberate communication on, you know, how you're going to roll it out and what it's going to be a democratized process on who's going to be involved and, and what their requirements are with it, and then detailed metrics on how successful it was or wasn't. I mean, perfect sure. example of operating asynchronously um, and, and having it focus on, okay, we'll call it culture, this, this broad um, blanket term that we're using here. Right. So for, for anyone out there listening who is interested in this, uh, this mindset shift that it really takes to, to operate in an asynchronous way, people who are, who are willing to adopt this mindset and want to use it to better position themselves in this new widespread world of remote work where, where everybody is uh, moving towards uh, working from home. Um, what sort of practical advice can you offer for business leaders on how to build and how to scale an asynchronous work environment, uh, you know, or, or to, to use asynchronous management? Sure. So I think this is a fantastic time because we're leaving the pandemic and we're entering an endemic stage. So a lot of these remote work requirements are now being released. I know in Canada where I'm at, they just uh, stated remote work is now voluntary, whereas it was a requirement uh, up until a few weeks ago. And I think as we enter, I actually really think about it as we're leaving the work from home state. And I hope that we're entering the remote state because remote work is really fantastic. You get to work wherever you want. You get to travel around. You get to be able to... Um, not be locked inside your house. You can work at a co-working space. You can work at a coffee shop, those types of things. So I think we're entering this really interesting new age. And what I would propose is a 90 day experiment. <clears throat> so either take a department or if you're currently still working remotely, implement a either a hybrid agreement or something like that inside of your organization if you're planning on going back to the office and focus on a few core tenants, which would be, any time that you have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, um, that can be synchronous. So when you have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you do not discuss metrics inside of that one-on-one -on -one conversation. You discuss issues that have come out of those metrics. So all of those metrics are already documented and are in some type of Google Docs, spreadsheet, whatever you use to be able to measure that conversation. And then you only discuss the issues outside of that conversation. We have, uh, we experiment with, with silent meetings, um, which we haven't rolled out everywhere, but basically it is, we identify all of our issues inside of Asana, which is the project management tool that we use. We discuss those issues through comments. And then if we've come to a conclusion on that particular issue, then we add the conclusion to the top of the ticket. And then we close the ticket. We say that that ticket has been completed. And if there are less than three issues during a meeting time, we don't do the meeting. So people just don't have to show up to that particular meeting. Uh, it's been quite interesting. We probably have cut our meetings from about, let's say, on the one meeting that I actually do meet synchronously on, uh, we probably, do, we were doing about six hours a month, and now we're down to about three hours a month. So that's a huge advantage for us, because I just got eight executives to be able to get three hours each of their lives back. Um, but generally, you know, like, one-on-ones are good, don't talk about met metrics, Project kickoff um, discussions are definitely ones that you want to have synchronous just to be able to get everyone rallied. Any customer facing sessions, um, sales calls, UX, product research, that kind of stuff, that's synchronous. Team meetings that are really just focusing on reinforcing the cultural differences inside of your organization, those are fine. Um, but the ones that I wouldn't necessarily have synchronous are brainstorming, 
sessions. So instead of that, actually prepare a document, again, put a ticket up on something like Asana, have that discussion through comments, and then have that conversation evolve that way. Any type of status update, uh, what I like to call show and tells. No, uh, no one needs to be shown or told. Uh, put together a video if you need to actually do a presentation. People can watch it at 2x speed and then can comment down below so that they can actually get that feedback. And then if there's any issues that come out of that show and tell, then have that as a synchronous conversation. Uh, anytime that you need to do things more than three times, you need to write it down and turn it into a process document. So inside of a lot of companies that I've interviewed, when I've asked a question, they've said, oh, well, yes, this is the answer. And they'll send me a URL to their internal wiki, as an example. Like, here's how we onboard a salesperson. Here's how we write a blog post. Here's how we work out issues that can't necessarily be worked out synchronously or asynchronously those types of things. So get all that information, put it into a documentation tool like a wiki, and then use that as the way to be able to manage people. Um, very simple decisions that require one individual person. I have a, I, I personal company thesis, which is don't tell me, don't ask me what to do. Tell me what you did. Any decision can usually be reversed within 24 hours. Just inform me of that decision and take your own direct leadership. And then even just, you know, creating reports, um, that kind of stuff, like all of that information should just be documented so that you have all those detailed metrics in place. And then someone like me, who's supposed to be your manager, even the concept of manager is actually getting reorganized a little bit. Most asynchronous organizations have effectively about half of the managerial layer of an in-person synchronous organization, simply because most of the work that a manager does is already being done by the platform. So again, those are just a couple little quick tips that you can try. Try two or three of them and just see how they work over a 90 day period. Then I would go ahead and survey those individuals and ask them, hey, what do you think? Did you like this? Would you like more of it? Would you like us to go further? Or no, we don't like this. Uh, we wanna go back to a more synchronous way of communicating. Yeah, I love that idea of leveraging technology to draw a hard line in the sand on what is synchronous, what is not synchronous, and then taking the time to let that play out, um, giving people a chance to settle in that in, into that type of rhythm, and, and, and then, you know, closing the feedback loop by finding out how well it worked. I think that's, that's great advice that anybody listening uh, and, and operating in a remote uh, setting can, can take and use to their advantage. So appreciate that. Yeah, there's also and, and one of the other comments that I'll make, particularly for the founders or operators of businesses, there's a lot of ego connected to kind of speaking to your team. You know, I, I love the, um, I like to get rid of the statement, my team or my department. You simply operate, you, you are operating inside of the marketing department. It's the company's department. You're just a cog in this machine fundamentally. And I think there's a lot of ego connected to that. So for people that are listening right now saying, man, I could never do that. Look inside yourself and ask yourself, is this, is this, are you thinking that way because you really think that the company couldn't operate that way? Or is it your own ego that's talking to you? Is your ego that's saying, hey, you know what? I actually really like telling people what to do or feeling important. And that form of selflessness um, is really problematic or the lack of selflessness is really problematic inside of large scale organizations. Anyone that is absolutely critical to the operations of the business as an example is an open, um, is an open stressor to the future of that organization. You are quite possibly going to get hit by a bus, or maybe you get an offer somewhere for three times your regular salary and you absolutely have to take it. And then it's the company that ends up suffering from that and the people inside of that organization. So it's really important to be able to check your ego at the door and say to yourself, am I actually doing this because it's what's best for the company or am I doing it because it's what's best for me because I feel cool and, and you know, good about it. I've spoken to a lot of people inside of businesses, like brick and mortar businesses, on-premise offices, 
And I am blown away that after talking to them for about 20 to 30 minutes, it really is, listen, I like that there are 500 people in this office and I like telling them what to do. <laughs> and it's just, then if, that, if that's how you feel, great, move forward on that. You will be replaced. You are the horse and buggy and it's 1915 and the first couple Model Ts are rolling off the line. And within the next decade, um, that way of running a business is just no longer going to be functional. Yeah, a lot of natural born micromanagers are going to have to take some, some long, hard looks in the mirror on that one. Absolutely. Well, hey, it's been a pleasure. Um, before I let you go, I wanted to ask you um, something we, we always do on this podcast. If there is one big thing, right? We, we talked a lot about asynchronous, uh, asynchronous work, the mindset, um, the, the, the advice for how you can manage asynchronously. If there's one big thing that listeners should take away from this episode. Uh, what would you say? Understand that remote work isn't just a nice to have. It's not an employee perk. It is the new way of operating a business. The genie has been let out of the bottle. And if you don't adapt to that model of working, you will probably be left behind. Fantastic. Well, hey, again, really appreciate having you here. Um, it's been a pleasure speaking with you and learning about asynchronous management. Um, for anybody who wants to learn more, whether it's about you, Time Doctor, running remote, or, or just asynchronous in general, um, where, where should they go take a look? Uh, the running remote community is really great. We've got a couple hundred people on there that are in a Slack community, and we talk about everything connected to remote work. The actual conference itself is happening May 17th to 18th. I would definitely check that out. And then the book is launching in August. And if you are part of Time Doctor or the Running Remote community, you'll get more details on that. But if you're not, I would just go check out Running Remote or Time Doctor and uh, put in your email address, and then we'll be able to tell you when it launches. Awesome. And we will include details on where everybody can go to find that kind of stuff in the show notes. Uh, with that, Liam, thanks again. Great to have you. We'll talk again. Thanks. Nice.